This is a podcast of Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. To learn more about how you can support Scripps, visit us online at scripps.ucsd.edu. The oceans move about one-third of the planet's surface heat from the equator to its poles, and scientists have long been eager to understand how they do it. One tool some oceanographers use is the computer model, a simulation that they program to replicate as faithfully as possible how water moves in the oceans. It's no easy task. The problem is that the important scales in the oceans are both very large and very small. So you have to be able to have something very large but with fine details and that is very difficult to do because it takes a lot of memory and computer time, for, at least from the modeling perspective. Also from the understanding point of view it's difficult to understand both the very large scale and the small scales and how those two um, extrema interact. But Scripps oceanographers Paola Cessi and Christopher Wolf have taken advantage of the power of supercomputers to create one of the most sophisticated models ever of the Atlantic Ocean. The model recreates the motions of swirling ocean currents called eddies. Eddies are tens to hundreds of kilometers in diameter, small in relation to the entire ocean, but important drivers of ocean circulation. Chessie and Wolf's model has produced one of the most accurate and dynamic simulations of the ocean ever. That allows us to observe and, and model these swirls that even though are, they are small, they transport heat eventually from one hemisphere to the other. And so that is, I think, our contribution. I don't think anyone has done a calculation with uh, such high resolution and for an extended period of time. Chessie and Wolf used the model to show that climate change could make the oceans move in different ways. They discovered that polar ice cap melting could create a seesaw effect as the vast pools of freshwater deposited from ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland change how salty Atlantic seawater flows within a major circulation component called meridional overturning circulation and how the ocean transports heat. One or the other could come to dominate and control the speed of Atlantic circulation. The thing that controls the strength of the overturning circulation is essentially the, or the, the range of densities that are shared between the northern uh, North Atlantic and the Southern Ocean. So basically you have this window right now in the Southern Ocean where there's, there's a patch of surface water which has got the same density roughly as the, the water that is sinking in the Northern Hemisphere and that gives a, a way to connect those two points through a, a circulation which goes through the deep ocean. Now adding uh, buoyant water by melting, melting ice in the Northern Hemisphere, the Southern Hemisphere has, has the effect of changing the size of those windows. If you add fresh water to the northern hemisphere, the water in the northern hemisphere can become lighter than any water found in the, in the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. So in that case, you would remove that window entirely by closing it off in the north. Or you can just make it shrink. And in that case, um, you would expect the overturning circulation to slow down. On the other hand, if you add fresh water to the southern hemisphere, you're making that water lighter and thus increasing the window that the Southern Ocean shares with the Northern Hemisphere. And that would cause the overturning circulation to speed up. Chessy and Wolf's model also confirms a recent revision of long-standing theories of ocean circulation that many researchers have come to embrace. In the Atlantic, they now believe that water travels the entire length of the ocean basin from Greenland to Antarctica. The realism of the model also suggests that the changes brought about by melting ice caps could happen within a few generations rather than over millennia. The overturning circulation uh, carries a lot of heat northward in the North Atlantic and, and is basically res are, is responsible in part for the temperate climate in the Northern Hemisphere. If you slow that circulation down, you expect the amount of heat transport to go down. And so you expect the countries, especially surrounding the North Atlantic, to become colder. And that could have dramatic negative effects. So just a few degrees could could change the way that crops are grown or, or livestock is grown and, and where people live. Conversely, if you speed up the overturning circulation, you could make the northern hemisphere warmer, which might seem like a good thing, but then you have the possibility that you could have more droughts, the deserts could expand. 
instead of thinking of things changing on thousands of years, we're actually thinking of things changing on decades, which is something which is very important. You know, you don't want to see uh, a major change in the climate in your lifetime. You would never be able to adjust to it. And so these are things that we're trying to understand from a conceptual level and then move into prediction and so that we can provide information for policymakers and the public in general to decide how to react to uh, the possibility of climate change. The two created their simulation, logging millions of computer hours on supercomputers in various locations around the country. But there is still much more computation to be done. Chessie and Wolf would like to be able to simulate a full revolution of the Atlantic circulation cycle and add still more realism to their model. In a sense, we've added a great deal of uncertainty uh, to the problem, but what we've done is taken false certainty and replaced it with, with accurate uncertainty. And then the whole, the whole uh, project going forward over the next few years is to create more actual certainty. We are trying to increase some of the geometric realism in our model, make, uh, adding coastlines and uh, bottom topography mountains. But I think we're still limited by computational power to do it in a single ocean base in the Atlantic. Ideally, you would want to have a global ocean at our resolution, but I don't think that the computer power yet is there and probably won't be there for another 10 or 20 years, but who knows? Maybe someone will come up with a brilliant idea and to make faster chips that use less energy and we will be able to do it sooner. This has been a presentation of Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego.